All right. Well, good morning. Good to be with you this morning. This is going to be a lot of fun. Go ahead and uh, grab your Bibles and open up to Acts chapter 2 is where we're going to start this morning. We're going to look at a couple verses there together, beginning in verse 41. Uh, We're going to jump around a bit as this is a little bit unusual for us as a church. We're not going verse by verse through a single book. This is a five-week series that we're in the middle of called Membership Promises. A little more topical in nature. That's not our norm. So just keep your Bibles open. There'll be a lot of verses on the screen for you this morning. Uh, But if you uh, were not here last week, here is really the question or the questions that we're wrestling with over this five-week series in July. The question is really this, what does it look like to be a faithful church member? What does it look like to be faithfully connected and fully engaged and fully surrendered and serving and involved in your local church? And maybe even a corollary question to that is this, is why does it even matter? Why does it even matter and what does the scripture call us to, to faithfulness as followers of Jesus to be engaged and connected to a local church family? Why does that matter? The springboard this morning for us to look at is right here in Acts chapter 2. I'm just going to read a couple of verses. Again, this is going to lead us into some other points. But really quick, the context, Acts chapter 2, if you've forgotten, this is the early church. The Apostle Peter has just preached the message of Christ crucified, resurrected. The Spirit of God has moved. Pentecost has taken place. The church has been born. The local church, particularly there in Jerusalem, is beginning to meet, beginning to organize themselves. And we learn some things right here in these two little verses about why does engagement in a local church matter and what does it even look like? So I'm just going to read these verses, make some points really quick. Luke, the, uh, Luke writes, he says this, so then, verse 41 Those who had received his word, those who had received the preaching of Peter there in Jerusalem at Pentecost, they had been born again by faith and repentance, they had turned from their old way, they had placed faith in this Messiah Jesus, they had been transformed. So look what happens to these transformed followers of Jesus. It says, so then those who had received his word were baptized. They followed the Lord. The first step of obedience was baptism by immersion. And that day, there were added about 3,000 souls. Incredible day. But they were added to what, you may say? We talked about this a little bit last week. You see here that they were immediately added. They were connected to something. They were connected to a body of believers. They were connected to this local church that was forming there in Jerusalem. That day there were added about 3,000 souls. What did they start to do? What did it look like? They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, the koinonia of God's people, to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. And you can continue to read that. So, So really quick, here's what you see. You see that The born-again believers were connected to a local church family. Now, I want to be really clear here from the beginning. Membership in a local church family certainly does not save a soul. Only Jesus does that. But the New Testament knows nothing of Jesus' followers not connected and fully engaged in the life of a local church family. Amen? Oh, that, come on. you got to help me. That was a great place for an amen. The New Testament, as you read along, simply knows nothing of a follower of Jesus doing their own thing, orbiting out here in Jesus' world, and not connected, engaged members and active of a local church family. It's throughout the New Testament. You see it right here in Acts chapter 2. I read this quote last week. It's really helpful for me. Pastor Kevin DeYoung says this. The New Testament knows nothing of Christians floating around in just me and Jesus land. Believers belong to churches. Amen? Believers belong 
and are engaged in local church families. We talked a little bit of the importance of that last week. You can go back and listen to that message. And that's really the motivation for this whole series is what does faithfulness to your local church family look like? Or we could ask the question this way. This is the challenge for all of us. Do you love your local church? Do you love your church? And what is... What does that look like in your life? What are the expressions of that in your life? I don't mean, do you love everything about your church? I don't mean, do you love every personality in your church? I don't even mean, do you agree with everything that is, your church may or may not be doing? Now, I'm assuming I'm talking to majority of TCBC people here. But I also know there's a lot of folks here that are new and you haven't connected to this or any church. And I know some of you are guests. So let let me just be real honest. The goal of this series is this. If you're new, one of the goals of this series, as we said last week, is this. That you prayerfully and convictionally determine that you are to belong to a local church. We hope it's this one. If it's not TCBC, we encourage you to find a good Bible-teaching, God-honoring local church and get involved. Maybe you're here and you say, this is my church, I haven't quite decided to land, and you are orbiting around. You're just kind of in the cosmos of orbiting around. You've not fully engaged, you haven't fully decided. The encouragement as we walk through scripture to you is say, this is my church home, I'm going to fully engage, I'm going to fully plug in for all the blessings and benefits and obedience that it is to be rightly connected to a local church family. Maybe you say, hey... Mr. Mike, you're preaching to the choir. I've been a part of this church for 20 years, 30 years. Well, the prayer for you is, as a part of this series, that that your love and commitment and sacrifice and honoring of your local church will only be revived in Christ. And you will love your local church even more and more and more. And most of all, the head of the church, Jesus, who died for the church. So that's kind of the hope of this series as we continue to ask this question, okay, how, what does it look like to love your local church well, okay? So that's where we're going. So here's how we're attempting to answer that question is this, how do we rightly love our church well? Here at TCBC, we have something called principles, practices, and promises, Principles and practices and promises. It helps us understand who we are as a church, what matters as a church. We have these principles. We started going over these last week. These are these steel girders that, if you will, are driven down into the ground. They're they're derived from Scripture. They lay the foundation for everything we do at our church. Talked about last week, God's glory. We talked about last week, biblical authority. This week we're going to talk about gospel sufficiency, and then we're going to talk about the church. We're the body of Christ. Those two foundational pillars this week. And then out of these come practices, things we do. Things we do as a church shouldn't just flow out of nowhere. They should come from these biblical principles. So we abide in Christ, we gather as a church, we equip the saints, we, we make disciples, we go make disciples, live on mission. We'll talk about all those. And then finally for us, I hope most helpful in this series is we have something called our membership promises. Promises come out of these principles, now these practices, and here's basically what these promises mean. What, what can you expect as a member of this church? What should I expect from you as a member of this church? What should you expect from me as a member of this church? As an overflow of Christ in us? As our love for one another? So that's the, that's the direction we're going. And these principles, practices, and promises that help us, Tri-Cities Baptist Church, answer the question, what does it look like to love our church well? All right? So last week, quick review, we looked at two of these foundational principles. I'm not going to go over them again. You can go listen to the message. If you've been through DTC, you've heard these, a little bit of review. So we talked about God's glory. We exist for Him. It's a foundational principle of our church. Secondly, last week, we talked about 
biblical authority. We spent a long time talking about the reality that as a church, coming from the Word of God, we believe the Bible is the ultimate source of truth. That's a really good spot for an amen, too. We believe foundational pillar driven down in the ground as a church. We build everything on it. The Bible, God's Word, is the ultimate source of truth. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. If we believe those things, then out of those will come promises that we make to one another. We talked about that last week, what those promises look like. So this week what we're going to do is we're going to take the next two foundational principles, talk about the actions that come out of those and the promises we make to one another. All right. Principle number three that we'll look at this morning briefly is this, gospel sufficiency. Gospel sufficiency is a biblical foundational pillar. Again, it's like one of those piles that are driven down in the ground. I'm not an architect, but I understand if you're going to build a massive building, there has to be incredible foundational piles that are nailed down in the ground so that building can stand and withstand everything that comes along. For us, these foundational principles are that. One of them this morning we're going to look at is gospel sufficiency. Here's the way we define that. Hugely important for all of us. Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. Meaning, wrapped up in who the person of Jesus Christ is. That's why we talked about that at the beginning of the service. Getting our minds and laying our lives at the reality of who Jesus is and all that Jesus has fully accomplished on your behalf and on my behalf is a foundational principle that we build everything else on. Because if you do not convictionally, this is huge, if you do not convictionally believe that who Jesus is and what Jesus has done is completely sufficient for everything related to life and godliness, you will try to live a life of earning. You will try to live your Christian life of, of, can I make myself good enough? Can I earn enough before God? Can I do enough right things? Can I get myself to the place where I'm loved and accepted by the Father? When Scripture says, no, you can't, but in Christ, He has done everything necessary for you to know God, to be fully accepted, to be declared righteous, and you can rest in the finished work of Christ. That's good news. That's what we mean when we say gospel sufficiency means Jesus Christ is enough. Who is he? Quickly, Scripture says this, John 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. What's the point? Jesus is fully God. Jesus is fully man. It's the God-man. No one like Him. 1 John 2, 1 says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Who's that? Jesus Christ, the righteous one. What a statement. Perfectly righteous. Perfectly pleasing to the Father. So he's the infinite God-man. And he's the perfectly righteous one. Therefore, from that, what did he do? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, we looked at this several weeks ago as we walked through 1 Peter, just a reminder. 1 Peter 2, 24 says this, And he himself, Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you were healed. Fully paid everything necessary for us to be made right and fully in Christ has granted to us his righteousness and here's the point he's sufficient his righteousness is sufficient 
You can't improve on the righteousness of Jesus in your standing before the Father. You rest in the righteousness of Christ that's been granted to you by faith and faith alone. See that? Rooted in who Jesus is, what Jesus has fully accomplished. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, He, God the Father, made Him, Jesus, who knew no sin... The perfect one. And that's important, by the way. A sinner can't die for a sinner. You say, well, I would give my life for my daughter or my son if I could. You can't because you're a sinner. Jesus, the perfect one, he made, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. If you're a Christian, some of this may be review for you, but it ought to be fresh to you every day to rest in the reality of who God is and who Christ is and what Christ has fully done. The gospel is good news. It is the announcement of who Jesus is and what Jesus has fully accomplished in your place, on my place, in my place, on my behalf. Now, that's gospel sufficiency. Jesus is enough. So if that is a foundational pillar, a foundation for our church, what flows out of that for us? How does that inform what we pursue? And how does that inform even how we relate to one another as God's people? That's where these membership promises come to play. So let me word it like this. Jesus is enough. If Jesus is enough, then... Therefore, here's our membership promise number one that flows out of this. It's this. We promise this is what you should come to expect of your church family. Call one another to this. To make much of Jesus, keeping him as the head of our church and calling people to abide in him. You should expect to be in a church where we make much of Jesus and we call one another to abide in Christ. What should your church family expect from you? To abide in my Savior Jesus. Now listen to these two words here. It's huge. To abide in Jesus my Savior by resting. Resting in his sanctifying and saving work through faith. And pursuing him through regular Bible study, prayer, and consistent practices of the spiritual discipline. Okay, Pastor Mike, I think I'll get all this. If... I really understand that the gospel is the finished work of Jesus, but there are ongoing implications of this gospel reality. It informs everything in our lives. These are the promises we make to one another to abide. So if Jesus is sufficient, the call to us is to abide in Christ. We just sang about it. So then what does it look like, Pastor Mike, to abide in Christ? If that's one of our pursuits as a church, one of the things we encourage one another, pursue one another in it, what does it look like to abide in Christ? I'll give you a couple scriptures on that, all right? John 15, 5. Jesus said this, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Jesus gives this metaphor of because of gospel sufficiency, because of the completeness of Christ, we're like this branch that is clinging to this vine because all life, all vitality, all resources comes to the life of this vine. And we hold on by faith to this vine. It's the life of the vine that's pressed down in the branches. That's us. We are connected. We are in union with the person of Jesus. That's the aspect of abiding that we rest in him. There's this assurance, there's this confidence that we are secure in Christ by faith alone. We, we rest in the finished work of Christ. Otherwise, your spiritual life is characterized by constant hurriedness, this constant anxiety, this constant guilt, this constantly, I must do more, I must accomplish more, rather than, no, 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 it has all been done in the person of Christ. A couple more verses about that. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature, old has passed away, behold, new things have come. We are in Christ. 
Therefore, there, there, therefore now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ, Romans 8.1. So there's very much a dimension of this when we know gospel sufficiency, Jesus is enough, we rest. One aspect of abiding is we rest in the finished work of Christ, but that's not all. See, something else that sometimes we miss in our understanding of the gospel is out of this resting, there will be a faithful, diligent pursuit. There will be this pursuit to grow in Christ's likeness and this pursuit of Jesus. We talked about in one of our promises is that. So if you're part of this church and you're a member of this church, it should be something that you continually expect, spur one another on, expect from one another to say, hey, you know Christ. Yes, rest in Christ. Rest in his finished work. Be overjoyed in that finished work. And out of that, there is this grace-motivated, God-honoring pursuit to know him more. There's this pursuit to be more and more like him. There's this pursuit of spending time in his word so that his word is shaping our thinking. There's a pursuit of him in prayer and the spiritual disciplines to grow more and more and more like Christ. So church family, we say this all the time. We talk about this abide principle. What does that mean? It means because Jesus is enough. Cause of gospel sufficiency, resting in who he is and what he's done, our hearts, our soul can say, it is well with my soul because of who he is. But in the same time, out of that, I want to grow. I want to be more like him. I want to pursue him, and I want to do that alongside you. And we spur one another on to more and more and more Christ-likeness. Amen? That's the Christian life. See, the Apostle Paul says it this way. He says in Philippians chapter 3, he says, I press on. Now, Paul rested in Christ. He knew his Savior. He had a complete relationship. He was resting in the finished work of Jesus. But he said, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. See, to be redeemed means that God's grace has awakened us to who Christ is. And we're overwhelmed that he has redeemed us, but it has awakened us to who Christ is. And I want to know him more. And I want to be more like him. And I want my life to honor him. That's not legalistic to say, oh, well, I've got to do this to earn. No, no, no. That's the overflow of grace in my life out of love and his love for me. And as a church, we spur one another on to this abiding relationship with Jesus. See that? There's more. If Jesus is enough, which we believe he is, gospel sufficiency, then another promise that flows out of that is this. We promise to make much of Jesus, keeping him as the head of our church, calling us to abide in him. But then also, what is the promises we make back to one another is this, to pursue holiness. To pursue holiness by the grace of God, living a life of obedience to Scripture as an ambassador of Christ and a representative of his church. So there's this resting in him. There's this pursuit of him. But then according to 1 Peter, this is huge for us this morning. Because what I'm getting ready to share, it's not going to be long, but I want you to understand this. Somehow, some way, the church believes and has begun to stray away from the gospel reality that God has declared us to be holy in Christ, but has called us to pursue holiness in our daily lives. First Peter says it this way, but like the Holy One who called you, you be holy yourselves in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. What's the motivation for that? Verse 18, what Christ has done, who Christ is. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold from your empty, futile, former way of life inherited from your forefathers. Here's the point. The blood of Christ, the cross of Christ, he has redeemed you from sin, and he has redeemed you and given you the capacity to put away sin in your daily life. The two go together. 
The pursuit of holiness is this desire motivated by Christ in us to pursue Jesus. And in that pursuing, watch, we put off anything and everything in our lives progressively that doesn't look like Christ, that doesn't honor Christ, and we put on all those things that are the nature of Christ and are the character of Christ. You say, holiness has always baffled me, that idea of holiness. Holiness is more and more and more of Christ in you, a greater likeness to the person of Jesus in your life. Jesus is the Holy One. And he has redeemed and purchased us to grow in holiness. And listen, church, one of the gifts we have is to encourage and spur one another on toward greater Christ-likeness. Don't love one another enough by settling for anything less. No, let's press on toward the goal for the prize of God in Christ Jesus for his glory. Amen? That's what a church family does. That's how we relate to one another. That's how all these membership promises connect. You say, what does it look like? We have good casseroles together. We have good fellowships. Yes, we may do all that. Praise God for casseroles. But beyond above that, are we spurring one another on to be more and more like Jesus the Son? For his glory and for his namesake. Gospel sufficiency says Jesus is enough. And out of that, we abide in Christ. See that? So God's glory is biblical principle. Biblical authority, foundational principle. Gospel sufficiency, talked about that. Now I'm going to walk through our fourth and final foundational principle this morning. And it's this. In the time we have remaining. Is this, the fourth foundational principle for us as a church is the church. (laughs) It's the reality of all that the Bible says about the church, that we are the body of Christ. That's a principle laid out in Scripture, and out of that flows, okay, here's what we do as the church. Here's how we relate to one another as the church. So let me show you a few of those. principle is this, the church, we are the body of Christ. Romans 12, verses 4 and 5. Paul writes and he says this, For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. One of the great gifts of the gospel is you've been purchased and you've been redeemed into a family, the body of Christ. Ephesians 1 says it this way, And he... Put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, to the fullness of him who fills all in all. Brothers and sisters, you are the body of Christ. (laughs) Jesus is the head of the body. And the New Testament gives us over and over and over that reality, that foundational truth. And then, okay, so how do we live out of that? If I'm the body of Christ, you're the body of Christ, we make up his body. What flows out of that according to the New Testament? So that's our next promise. If we are the body of Christ, then here's some things we promise to do. Here's some things that ought to characterize the people of God at this church. Here's how we relate to one another. Coming out of that is this. We promise together to worship with you. Member of this church. You should expect continually, regularly, consistently, we gather like this corporately to worship with you. Therefore, what should your church expect back from you? Therefore, I promise to gather with my church family to worship. (laughs) See, those sound repetitive. Listen, as a church, you should expect that we gather for worship. If you're part of this church, you prioritize the gathering of God's people. You gather with God's family to worship. We gather for worship. We abide in Christ. We gather for worship. Over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about how we equip the saints. And we're going to talk about how we go make disciples. But for the next 10, 12 minutes, I want us to talk about what Scripture says 
about the gathering of God's people. It's something that the Bible calls us throughout to do. Why do we do this? Why does it matter? What is the point of this? How is it prioritized in my life? Because as the body of Christ, we are called together as God's people. Acts 20 verse 7 says this. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together. Acts 20, the church gathers. 1 Corinthians eleven eighteen 18 says this. When you, as a church, gather together. The church is called together. Hebrews chapter 10, many of you know this passage, says this. And let us consider... How to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting meeting together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another day by day as you see the day drawing near. One of the practices of a local church since the beginning of the church is the gathering together of God's people for worship. Why do we do that? Why is that so prioritized in the Bible? What does that look like for us? Well, corporate worship is a vital aspect of our life in Christ. We gather to celebrate the greatness of God together. We do all these things together so that to one another we honor and worship this King together for one another. We celebrate the greatness of God together. One of the reasons I think the Bible gives us the gift of gathering like this is we demonstrate that we belong to something bigger than ourselves. That's a huge point. I don't want you to miss that. One of the reasons I believe the New Testament calls us to gather like this in the visible corporate gathering of God's people is so that you can look around, lift your eyes and see, wait a minute, I'm part of something bigger than me. It's not just about me. I'm connected to this body of Christ that's bigger than I am. And if you haven't taken a minute this morning, just look around. Just look at each other. Don't don't kind of gawk at each other. Just kind of glance around and look. You're part of something bigger than you. You're part of something called the body of Christ. And in God's wisdom... He calls us to regularly, physically gather like this to be reminded that you are part of something, not just out on your own. You're part of something bigger than yourself, the very body of Christ on earth. What a gift. We gather to celebrate together. One of the things we learned through COVID really quick is this. I think we have a We have a broken understanding of the difference between personal worship, which we're called to do in every dimension of our lives, and this thing called corporate worship that the people of God are called to do when we gather together. They're they're both important, they're both called for, but they're not the same. Yes, you're called to worship in every dimension of your lives. But the Bible is clear. There is something unique, something special, a gift, a grace. That is given to us when you and I gather physically together to worship our King. This thing called the gathering for worship. What a gift. One of the things we do as a church because we so value. I'll just chase this really quick. I think it's important. One of the things we value and prioritize as a church in this gathering is we, we encourage, we challenge, we believe convictionally that we worship as families. Which means we encourage you parents, bring your kids into the service. We want them to worship alongside of you. Hey, I'll just say it this way. Maybe you come from another church. Maybe you've asked this question. We're not a children's church kind of church. Meaning convictionally, we don't create some alternate worship service and then say, okay, little Johnny, go do your thing and leave mom and dad alone so we can really focus and worship. You go worship on your own. We're not that kind of church. We have children's programmings, we have opportunities, we have incredible kids' ministry, y'all know that. But we believe with all the messiness and all the distraction and all the noise that it might create with kids and families in the worship service, watch this, we believe it is of such value families are to worship together. We believe that as a church. We pursue that as a church. This gathering is a gift that God has given us. I'll quote a man named Legan Duncan. He says, public worship worship occurs when the people of God assemble. 
for the express purpose of giving to the Lord the glory due His name and knowing the joy of His promised unique presence with His gathered people. There's a unique manifestation of the presence of the Lord in this thing called the gathering. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. Therefore, one of the things we do is we gather for worship. We gather for worship. Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25 says, but encouraging one another. Let's not neglect the gift of this thing called the gather. Now, you already know this, but I want to go through the things that happen and take place in the gathering. So, Pastor Mike, I know we kind of do some different things in the gathering, but, but why do we do those things? And where does that come from? And there's a lot of things we don't do in the gathering. Why do we not do some of the, those things in the gathering? Let me give you the five or six things that we do in the gathering and why we do these. You can take notes on these. The, these will not be on the screen. What takes place when we gather? Number one, preaching. You say, well, I get that. When, when people, when God's people are gathered together, one thing the Bible calls us to do, 2 Timothy 4, 2, is this. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. If you're part of these gatherings, just know, center will always be the teaching and the preaching of the word of God. Now, if you're new here, you know we... We do that as a teaching team. There's not one primary teaching pastor. We have a teaching team. You say, why do you do that? Well, none of your three teaching pastors, we think, are anything extraordinary on our own. In fact, we're not convinced we're very good pastors or teachers at all. But we think maybe three of us together can make a half-decent pastor and teacher. And we believe the giftings of plurality are very beneficial for you. So part of the gathering will be the preaching and the teaching. Part of the gathering will be baptism and the Lord's Supper. One of our promises is we we will practice the ordinances as a church when we come together. We're going to celebrate the Lord's table together in just a moment. We have corporate prayer together. Why? Scripture calls us to do that. Yes, pray individually. Yes, pray as families. There's power when God's people come together corporately praying together. We try to do that almost every week. Scripture calls us to have the reading of Scripture, not just the teaching, but the public reading of Scripture. 1 Timothy 4.13, until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, teaching. So we read the Scripture together. We give together. That's different post-COVID. We used to pass the plates. We used to do all that. We don't do that in the same sense. But one of the things the Bible holds out is, yes, we give individually. But one of the reminders is when we come together to be challenged in this act of worship of giving financially. We try to remind you of that every week. Give online, give in person, whatever that looks like. And then finally, we sing together. We sing and praise together. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom. We sing together. doesn't mean we all sing on note or we all sing (laughs) very well, especially me. You say, is God honored when I sing by myself? Yes. But God is greatly honored when the chorus of his redeemed come together and we make this great choir together and we sing. It's instructional. We learn from what we sing. It's encouraging and it's worthy of our God. It's glorifying to God when we sing together. So those are the things we do as called by scripture when we gather together. So I want you to know this morning one of the great gifts that has been given to you and I as God's people is this gift of the gathering. One of the things I've had the privilege over many years as a pastor and been able to travel all over the world is to meet with God's people in gatherings like this literally all over the world. In buildings sometimes, sometimes in gatherings that are under trees in the middle of Africa, sometimes in homes, sometimes in jungles, sometimes in cities, sometimes with many, sometimes with few. But I've also known what it means to gather with God's people at times was in Laos years ago. And some of you guys have been on a trip to Laos with us and remember gathering with God's people on Sunday evening. And as we gathered, they had to 
mount a guard at the door to watch for the government officials because it is illegal to gather as a church in the country of Laos. Now watch this. I'll never forget sitting in a chair in this makeshift place we were gathering in the country of Laos and realizing for the first time, wait a minute, these people know there's risk. These people know it might even cost them imprisonment. But these people have gathered because the gathering of God's people to them is not a good option. It's not something just to tack on my week. It is a mandate given by our king. It is a blessing. And they were gathering even in the midst of risk. It was a priority for them. One of the things that came out of COVID for us as a church that was a blessing, and there were some blessings, is many of us for the first time realized, wait a minute, we're not going to be able to gather like we normally gather. And there were some challenges for all of us to say, you know what, we're not gathering just out of convenience. We're not gathering just because it's a neat thing to do. We're gathering because God has called his people together and there is value in it. And one of the things that came out of COVID is we started chasing and we started putting all these other rhythms back into our lives. But many of us failed to prioritize the meeting of God's people again because God calls his people together. This thing is a gift. So because we are the body of Christ, we gather together for worship. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to ask the team just to come on up, and they're going to begin to play. And I want to give you some really, really practical things, and then I'm going to lead us into the Lord's table, and we're going to do one of those things together that we do. We're going to celebrate the Lord's table. But when you're teaching pastors, one of your elders, Pastor Daniel, wrote a elder level letter several weeks ago and I thought it was just really helpful this is incredibly practical what are some things you can do and we can do as families to gather well that as you prepare for the Sunday gathering and you prepare to come and be with God's people what are some things we can do to gather well I'm going to give these to you really quick and then we're going to move into a time of the Lord's Supper they're not on the screen you can write these down number one be present <laughs> First thing you can do to gather well is be present. Prioritize the gathering of God's people. Number two, be early. There's huge value, parents, to teach the value to your kids as we run to and fro in every other area. The gathering of God's people, I'm going to prioritize it. I'm going to plan ahead. I'm going to get there early, and I'm going to be ready. Number three, be prepared. Put everything aside. Lay aside all the distractions. Be prepared to meet with God in a unique way in the gathering. Number four, be uncomfortable. Be uncomfortable. Come to the gathering missionally. Move around. Be ready to serve. Be ready to maybe get out of your norm. Sing loud. Challenge one another. Be ready to be rebuked. Be ready to be challenged. Be uncomfortable. And then finally, be responsive. Be prepared to hear the word of God, not just be hearers, be doers, ponder, repent, change, practice, pray, gather to be transformed. And let's prioritize this gift of the gathering for the glory of our great God. Amen. Father, thank you for this time. I pray now, Lord, for the gift the Lord's Supper that we're about to take together as your people, Lord, I pray you prepare our hearts. Lord, I thank you for gospel sufficiency of who you are and what you fully accomplished. Lord, we rest in you. Lord, give us the grace to pursue you as we rest in who you are. Lord, we thank you for the gift of the church. We are the body of Christ. And Lord, out of that, one of the things we do is we gather as your people. One of the things you call us to do is to celebrate this thing called the Lord's table, the Lord's supper. Prepare our hearts for that right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.